it looks like that whole bombing the moon thing uh, turned out worked rather well. Thank you very much, you doubters, me among them. Bill Nye, the science guys, I guess ago, next. You'll recall that we crashed a spacecraft deliberately into the moon. Pow, right in the kisser. The idea was that the impact would send up a plume of debris. NASA would analyze that debris to find out exactly what type of green cheese and everything else the moon was made of. As a side benefit, everyone thought that the spectacle of the moon bombing would be a really cool thing to watch from Earth. It um, wasn't. The live video stream was a little hinky, and even astronomers with really good telescopes couldn't really see much of a moon bombing at all. So as a spectacle, bust. But as an audacious, ambitious science experiment, bingo. What NASA was really looking for in that debris plume was water, and they found it, a lot of it. That plume that we couldn't see from Earth? contained at least 24 gallons of ice and water vapor, along with all kinds of other unidentified compounds. We also learned as a result of this experiment that NASA can be really cute and snarky when they are excited about something. Their press release on their findings today started with, quote, the argument that the moon is a dry, desolate place no longer holds water. The chief scientist for the mission declared, quote, the moon is alive. And another scientist proclaimed, this is not your father's moon. Because NASA is excited, I will admit I'm excited, but I will also admit that I'm not otherwise exactly sure why this is an exciting thing. To help me understand and help you understand what I will admit to being excited about before really understanding it, we will turn to Emmy Award winner and scientist Bill Nye, the science guy. Bill, thank you very much for being here. Oh, Rachel, it's so good to be here. Am I just experiencing pointless excitement by proxy, or is there cause to be psyched that there's water on the moon? Yes, and sort of. <laughs> <clears throat> so first of all, freezer burn. You ever left something in the freezer and it dries out? Yeah. Goes away. The water goes away. Because the freezer, being cold, can't hold water vapor very well. So when you go to the south pole of the moon to a crater that never gets any sunlight for, say, the last 300 million years, you would expect a lot of freezer burn. It's fair enough. Sure, you'd expect it to be all sorts of poor frosty. You wouldn't want to eat that ice cream. No, no, you'd expect it to evaporate. Okay. That's what I'm driving at. You expect all the water to evaporate. But since about 1961, uh, people have argued that there's enough chemical attraction between water and the rocks of the lunar regolith, the lunar soil, that the water should persist there where the sun, if I may, don't shine. <laughs> And so, uh, in fact, it has. They smacked it hard, we smacked it hard enough, and this plume, as you described it, went up into space, and it had about a, um, 100 kilos uh, of, had 10 kilos of water in it. And that's uh, surprising, uh, surprising to many. But let me just say, I don't think this is cause for everybody to build a nuclear reactor and send a bunch of astronauts to the moon with my tax dollars to have a moon base and live off the land. That is an extraordinary step. And do you think that, uh, so th this obviously proved that the people who thought that there could be water there were right. The, as you're alluding to, the other thing that it seems to imply is that because there's water there, the moon might be more helpful to us than we otherwise thought it might have been in terms of getting out further into the universe to see what's there. Do you think the, the water there doesn't help us or you don't care about what's on the moon? Oh, no, 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 no. Here, there's two questions, Rachel, that, may, that plague humans from the moment they start being humans. Where did we come from, and are we alone? So what you'd want to do is go to a place that has water. That's what we'd all want to do, thinking that the chemistry that makes us us would have similar chemistry on another world, and maybe we would find evidence of life or a means for it, uh, to support our own lives, to have a camp, a, a moon base. But there's so little water. Like, there may be less water, if, for example, in the Antarctic desert than there is in the lunar surface. But that there is any water at all is remarkable. Instead, yes. I would prefer uh, us to send people to Mars. 
where it's also dry, but perhaps we could use the same techniques we used here looking for water to look for water on Mars and a logical place to look for life, and then it, we would answer questions about where we came from. Is the pro problem, uh, you, the disadvantage scientifically to you of going to, moon, the, going to the moon sort of a been there, done that thing that we should be shooting at Mars so that we don't just keep doing something that we've done before? That's right. We, and people argue that we need to go to the moon in order to learn how to go to Mars. Well, we would remind you that we have dozens of assets of spacecraft on Mars as it is, and when humans first went to the moon, they'd never been there before. <laughs> you go a place you haven't been before because you haven't been there before. So uh, it's exciting, and it's cool, and I remind everybody, for in tax dollars, it was done for a very reasonable price. But I don't think this justifies building a moon base and having human farms with greenhouses and so on. <laughs> Bill Nye, the science guy, thank you for I helping us put this in calendar, today's date, November 13th, 2009, is written as 12 19 16 15 6. And on December 21st, 2012, the Mayan date will be 13 0 0 0 0. That's the end of the Mayan calendar, and that means we're all in trouble. Except it doesn't really. The normal thing in the Maya calendar after you end a cycle is another cycle begins. And if you were going to talk to the ancient Maya, that's what they'd say. This isn't the end of time. We're just starting another cycle. Yeah, but there aren't many ancient Mayans around anymore. Still, one of NASA's chief scientists says, don't worry, the Earth's got a pretty good track record. The last colossal event that affected the history of life on Earth was 65 million years ago. Fences are failing all over the park. Although that didn't end so well for the dinosaurs. And then they took their revenge in Jurassic Park, which just goes to show this stuff never gets old. Tom Costello, NBC News, Washington. Dr. Michio Kaku is a theoretical physicist, author of the bestseller Physics of the Impossible, and host of the upcoming series called Sci-Fi Science, airing December 1st on the Science Channel. Doctor, welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Okay, yes or no, the history of the planet Earth ends in 2012. No, and don't quit your day job. Don't sell the furniture. You may be homeless in 2013. Now, you have seen the movie, and I don't want you to spoil anything, or actually spoil whatever you want. Uh, give us an idea of how much destruction is in this thing, and what, if any of it, is possible. This movie is the mother of all shake-and-bake movies. It has that wow factor. India is submerged. A mile-high tidal wave devastates Washington, D.C., and it all starts because the Earth is aligned with the sun toward the center of the galaxy. One problem, that happens every December. And hey, we're still here, aren't we? <laughs> every December. That's right. All right, now NASA was worried enough about this uh, movie that they've actually uh, tried to push back and debunk it. Has, has NASA, has, has a movie ever pushed NASA this far that they feel they have to get the word out that don't worry, the world's not going to end? I think this is the first time that NASA has been overwhelmed with thousands of emails in a contest between Hollywood and NASA. It's no contest. Hollywood has the best PR people, the best special effects people, and hey, NASA ought to get its PR up to speed as well. NASA was caught with his pants now, down. Now, uh, one theory, I mean, I mean fantasy that's uh, in this movie is that a rogue planet will bombard Earth and destroy us in 2012. NASA says that that's not going to happen. How do they know that's not going to happen? Why couldn't something come from out of nowhere and destroy us? Well, first of all, the Mayan calendar ends in 2012 and was meant to be celebration, a new cycle emerging, and it makes no mention of Planet X. Planet X is supposed to be way out there beyond Pluto, but we've scanned everything outside Pluto. All we see are pieces of ice and debris. So Planet X is not coming. Well, now let's get to water on the moon. Uh, what is the significance of discovering uh, gallons and gallons of water on the moon? 
This is big, real big, because water, ice, is worth more than gold on the moon. To put a pound of anything on the moon costs about $50,000. That's five times the weight in gold. With water, you can extract hydrogen for rocket fuel, oxygen for breathing, and it's also good as a shield against cosmic rays and solar flares. This is a no-brainer. I mean, uh, and NASA really scored the jackpot here. But how much, I mean, the things you're talking about require a lot of water, don't they? I mean, how much water do they have to discover to make those kinds of processes viable on the moon? Well, 24 gallons out of one football field doesn't seem like much. But realize that that 24 gallons of water was worth more than gold on the moon. We could shave literally millions, hundreds of millions of dollars right off the top of the space program. And remember, it's cost. Cost is the reason why Obama is thinking of scaling back the space program. If we find water on the moon, water that does not have to be carried to the moon at $50,000 per pound, hey, that's a game changer.